slip of a girl. She never flinched. And I never saw one who did flinch. You were expected to just get on with so many jobs, and many of those jobs were not things that you were prepared for. You were only 18, 19 years of age, and even being left with somebody who's been blown up and...
in around uh, medication. And uh, you know, you don't have to swallow all these pills. I must have had a handful. Did I really say that? <laughs> well, not, not, no, that's not verbatim. That's not verbatim. But, but it was to advise me, you know, if you don't need the Valium, if you don't need uh, the dyslegesic, if you don't need this, then take it when you actually are in need of it. The questions oh. that I was seeking answers And one of the nurses said to me afterwards, oh, I couldn't have done that. I would have refused. And I thought afterwards, was it right that she would refuse if she couldn't give him the best care? Or was it wrong because we were, we were under an oath really to look after everybody, regardless of who or what they were or what they had been involved in? That was a difficult road to travel sometimes. 
when in actual fact the person who you were caring for was a person who you knew was responsible for death and destruction. But you know, you couldn't linger on that. Armed security forces occupy the wards of the hospital when their wounded colleagues are under treatment. A constant reminder of the troubles as the day-to-day -day healing goes on. The hospital I worked in, at the front gate, you had the uh, uh, Republican paramilitaries. And at the back gate, you had the Loyalist paramilitaries. And then sandwiched in between uh, was uh, a British Army uh, base actually within the hospital perimeter. No one can know what the next... I think sometimes people expect that when you work in a hospital, that's where everything is going to be seen and that's the seat of the action. 
I discovered when I did my community placement in North Belfast that that, in fact, wasn't the case. I was never afraid, never afraid, because people were all, all very kind to each other and very helpful in those days. And uh, no, I never was afraid. The only time I was afraid was when I was in crossfire, as that happened, or n maybe near an explosion, or driving along and, and, and being in a traffic jam or sitting at the traffic lights and looking at somebody in a car or a van or whatever, wondering if there's a bomb in there. We were in a little lady's house. She needed her um, leg dressings renewed. And we were in with this lady and I was on my knees doing the dressings and uh, the district nurse was supervising me. And then all of a sudden there was this nightmare noise out the back. And the scullery doors, it was called then, burst open and then came a hooded gunman. And he raced past us through the living room and out into the hall, making his escape to th through the front door into the street. So for a nanosecond, absolutely nothing happened. I looked at the district nurse and she looked at me and we both looked at the wee lady and she sort of went, sure, what can you do? Bombay Street was a very distressing experience. It did look like a scene from Gone of the Wind. Anyone been burnt out of their home is a very distressing thing, and certainly distressing for, for the people involved, and I think it's quite, quite dreadful that that should happen to anyone. And there they were moving, and all their furniture and, and their belongings on, on, on trucks and top of cars, and, and they were moving to a hall or a school just to, to be safe. All day Friday and Saturday, the evacuees from the Catholic ghettos on the Falls and Ardoin went north to Andersonstown. There, six church halls and schools were mobilized for the emergency. They had centers, they had night shelters. This was after Bombay Street, and people were scared to stay in their homes, and they provided So, yeah, I said, certainly. So we all had ginger snaps as we waited to be rescued.
those people had to get treated. I'm not saying it was, it was just one of those things that ev nobody expected what happened that day to happen. It was not on anybody's radar. Corn was a Saturday. I was on duty, and we, we got this message to say that, that this that this explosion had occurred, and there were many casualties. It was just absolute chaos initially because there were so many people came in. There were so many horrendous injuries. A lot of them were amputations, the legs, legs and arms that had just disappeared. And I remember one woman was lying with the, with the leg of a, of a, a chair, a, you know, a, a dining room chair, right through her leg. We could hear the ambulances coming, all the sirens going. And the more sirens you could hear, the more you knew it was really going to be bad. When they didn't turn off their claxons, you knew it was serious that the ambulance men were in a state. I heard this noise and I could hear the screams of the girls inside the ambulances over the sound of the claxons. Then the other thing about the, the Abercorn was the fact that they were mostly girls of our own age. Uh, we were all young. Uh, the Abercorn was a place, the first place to be bombed, in my experience, where I might have been if I'd been off duty. Not only did that make it personal, but also the fact that one of our own staff members, a, a radiographer uh, from our own department, was killed in it. And the next time I saw her, I was holding her remains in my hands. It was a lovely day. A lovely summer day and the baby clinic was very busy because it was child assessment as well and there was a great buzz in the place and then at three o'clock a bomb went off and then there was the second and the third and the fourth, and the fifth, and the sixth. And it was just chaos. Now, I went up to the Royal after that. The casualty was full, there were people crying, there, were pe there was people in pain, there were relatives coming up, um, there were ambulances still coming in. Um, everybody was working flat out. And I ended up, um, because there were body parts coming in, uh, which were just like a pound of meat, frankly. Um, and they were being put on a trolley. I just kept looking at this trolley and thinking, that is somebody, you know, that is, that is somebody there. And I know it probably sounds very, very stupid, but I, I just got really, really defensive about this trolley. And I, I, I thought, I have to mind this trolley. And I covered it. I, I thought it was like, to me, it was like a naked patient. And I got very angry. I got, you know, I stood there and I thought, how dare anybody do this? I wish they could see what they have done. I just wish they could have seen the distress, the, the anguish, the results, uh, which was my trolley. And for what? Monday morning, back in the clinic, three days after Bloody Friday, one mother lost her husband, blown up at the bus station, coming home from work, identified by his hand. That big coffin, for one hand. One of the things that I told myself at the beginning of working in intensive care, I would never lie to a patient. I would always tell the truth. And when someone said to me, as did um, 
one of the patients from the Abercorn, why are my legs so sore? When will they feel better? It was a Sunday afternoon. It was very peaceful, and I had gone in to relieve the nurse for tea and to look after the patient. And I then felt she asked me, she wanted the information, and it was my job to tell her that she had lost her leg, both legs and an arm. The first memories I have of nursing staff was in Ward 17. I asked this nurse, I think she was a student nurse who was passing, where am I? And um, she said, uh, you're in the Royal Victoria Hospital. You, you've, you've been in a bomb explosion. Mm -hmm. So I think I just went back to sleep again. I think I was asking that question every day. Right. <laughs> the reality started to set in, oh, you know, yes. and I didn't realise I'd lost my legs, you know, you because you still have that sensation. Yes, of course. My arm was in plaster, so I just thought, oh, something has happened to my arm. I didn't really know the extent of my injuries at all. Right. Um, until um, the nurses actually told me. And uh, have you any idea how, how long that was after the bomb? Um, I, I think it was about, could be about a week or so. I'm right. not really sure. You know, days just tend to sort of... Right. Did you remember that one. Rosaline had been with you? Yes, oh, I did. Uh -huh. uh, and did you want to see Rosaline? Um, well, when I heard what had happened to her, yes. As a nurse said to me one day, um, your sister's photograph was in the paper. Oh. And I couldn't understand why. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, right. And I said, I said to Mummy when she came in, uh, you know, Rosaline's photograph was in the paper, and she said yes. I said, I want to see it. I couldn't understand why oh, she was in yeah. the paper. 